I want to just thank very much in terms of the, the home team here at the British Red Cross for uh, hosting us today. Um, and the cooperation has been fabulous. Thank you. And also with uh, REAP and to, to Ben and the team for helping with the agenda and connections and so on. I think a real signal with IID and ICAD working together to, to put on an event like this. And in some ways, that is also a signal of those organizations collaborating that highlights from a loss and damage perspective who we need to bring together. You know, you've got humanitarians working together, those that are bringing the science, bringing the research and evidence, bringing the community connections and so on. And great to see in the room and Rowan, welcome to you, uh, bringing insurance in as well and, and the, the world uh, about a mile uh, in that direction. So I think that's fabulous. I think also... Um, I want to just note that we've got people in the room here, and it's great to see you in person. And I know London Climate Week has been about meeting in person and so on. But also, we've got people from all around the world, including from um, communities on the front line of the impacts of climate change, suffering loss and damage. And I think it's really nice then that we can have an event where we can try and pull off the technology that is about a genuinely global event, while also having a group of people in the room here. So. Um, really uh, delighted with that opportunity. Then the other bit of choreography that we're going to try and pull off today is the fact that we've got speakers here in the room and we've got speakers in different parts of the world. And so we're going to be going through these three panels chaired by uh, esteemed colleagues who will come on and introduce themselves. The first one really looking at the practical experiences of loss and damage. What is actually working to tackle loss and damage? Second panel saying, right, well, how do we scale that up? And the third panel looking at what are the options for actually putting the money into that that uh, allows you to get to scale. So that's necessarily how we're gonna cover things today. And one, I suppose, were request is that this was intended to be a panel and a process that looked at the practical experiences. What can we do now, given that there are people really suffering loss and damage? This is not, a space where we're gonna have a big discussion about the politics of loss and damage finance or of governance and so on. And we've deliberately designed it like that because we think the agency that we can take now is about that practical action. Let's not wait for some political process that may or may not land in some X period of time where that's frankly probably already well, very, very late in the process. So I would really request that when you come in with questions, let's not have a, um, uh, uh, a big discussion about the politics of loss and damage. This is about the practical components. Um, just also uh, at start of thanks as well to those who've been able to work on the tech today. And I know there's been good cooperation between the organizations, but we'll keep our fingers crossed that we can both have people from around the world, speakers coming in from around the world and so on. But let's see, and we will um, hope that that uh, comes off um, beautifully. And I think without further ado, we should get on with the order of business. Um, I think one final component is that some of you will be aware that um, we've been trying to pull together this um, program called All Act. And, and the idea of All Act being an alliance of organizations working on the practical dimensions of loss and damage. And so to those partners who are already involved in All Act, um, welcome as well. And to those who are online. Um, and we're certainly looking at how we can um, really draw on what is an enormous practical experience already around the world of how to tackle loss and damage. Let's not think of this as something that is radically new or different to what has already been experienced in many places. This is about building on the collective resources that we've got and acknowledging that the nature of threats is changing in a very rapid way. So welcome to all those who are involved in All Act. And if you want to know more, I'm delighted to um, talk more with you about that. Right, let me pass over to those then on the first panel. If you could join me um, up on stage and I'll pass over to you, Salim, as the, uh, as the chair of that panel and maybe you can introduce your panelists as well. Um, over to you, do you wanna take the mic? Sure. Thank you very much, Tom, and uh, good afternoon to everybody here in the room and uh, also everybody online. Um, so as Tom just mentioned, I'm going to be uh, moderating the first session. Uh, my name is Salim al Haq. I'm the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development at the Independent University of Bangladesh. I'm normally based in Dhaka, but I happen to be in London uh, for the London Climate Action Week. And it's a great pleasure to be co-organizing this event with IID and with our other partners, the British Red Cross and REAP. So session one 
we're going to be hearing from three panelists. I'll introduce them in a moment on examples of things that are already being done. So loss and damage from climate impacts is not new. They've been happening for many, many you know, generations forever. What is new is that the temperature has gone up above 1.2 degrees centigrade, and that's making things worse. So there's going to be a lot more impacts of climate change to come and losses and damages from those impacts to follow, for which we need to be much, much, much better prepared than we have been. But we need to build on what exists, what we know, what we are doing, and that's the purpose of this particular panel. I'm going to hand over next to uh, Sheila Patel, who again needs no introduction to uh, people in this uh, uh, audience. Uh, Sheila has a very long history of working with slum dwellers international globally in India in particular, but also all over the world, and particularly working with women living in the slums in uh, the cities uh, around the world, in the developing world. And they've been doing some very remarkable uh, activities and practices, which I feel are extremely relevant that we can then build on going forward, learn from and scale up going forward. So Sheila, support. and support, absolutely. So Sheila, tell us a little bit about some things that you feel we can build on that your colleagues are doing. Thanks, Salim. Uh, you're giving me five minutes, right? Five minutes. I have to compress 40 <laughs> years in five minutes. So I'm going to. Uh, is it on? It's yeah. on. Okay. So I'm going to give you two examples that reflect the way in which we began to deal with what we thought were crisis and which now we have a label for called losses and damages. So the first one was that my work began with people who lived on the pavements of Mumbai and faced evictions from the municipality every 15 days to a month. And we had developed protocols of how to get early warning. You know, you get these gray vans that come. Uh, so there's always somebody from the nearby area who will quickly come and tell you that the vans are coming. As soon as you know the vans are coming, you take everything that is important in your house and you stash it in a safe place. You remove all the building material that you want to save and you leave the kachra, the, the, the things you don't care that you can easily replace for them to take away. Uh, once it so happened that we were not able to do that and they broke the houses, and there's also a standard procedure that the people who are the daily wage workers, who are also slum dwellers themselves, are told you can take all the stuff inside the house and you can sell them. So the new protocol we did after that was that we would always find a local photographer who would photograph the whole event, take the you know, names of the badges of the people and everything, and then follow these people when they take the material to sell it. And we use that as an evidence to put a public interest litigation in the court because our lawyers always told us that you guys are all bleeding hearts and you think the courts will feel sorry for you. The courts only uh, you know, give you a judgment that's based on the law and the law says they can evict you. So he says, now you have evidence that they have taken your property. And you won't believe the women had made a list of 26,000, a very small amount in pounds. But every single thing was documented, the houses were numbered, and the Municipal Corporation of Mumbai had to give a check of $26,000, which the guy who broke their houses had to give to them. And that produced lots of different things. Now, we didn't know that now that we say that all disasters are man-made, should we include evictions in this or not? But those are the kind of things that began our own understanding of that. Another traumatic exit, I don't know how many of you remember that in the year 2000, Smoky Mountain, which is a garbage dump in the Philippines in the Metro Manila area collapsed and a whole settlement was destroyed and half of the people died. Two months before that or sometime before that, 
a team from another SDI country, which included India, had gone there to train communities to do detailed mapping of houses. And so that neighborhood around that area knew every single household, what was the amount of land they had, how many people were there, how many had died. That was also the year that my colleague got the Maxis A award. And so when he went and met the president, he says, by the way, uh, this is what happened at Smoky Mountain. And these are the people who need new houses. And short of taking a checkbook out and signing it, next day he came to the settlement. He was that famous actor who became the president of Philippines. He came with a check, not only of his contribution, but all the parliamentarians, and they rebuilt all those houses. So what I want to bring to your notice is that poor people have long and deep experiences of coping with crisis and developing ingenious ways to survive it as much as they can. But the reality is it's a leaking bucket. It keeps reducing their ability to deal with things. It reduces their assets and it depletes their energy. And it's only when you create large networks that come and help you and support you that the energy to continue goes on. So within STI now we have a, we have, we collect money from different donors and we have a protocol where we send $10,000 immediately to that city because our communities are fed up of soup kitchens. They say, everybody feels sorry for us for the first five days and then they forget about us. So, we don't want that kind. We want, we want our community to be fed by us. And when we feed each other, we document the whole thing and we decide what alternatives to do. And the reality is that the alternatives mean you build another house again in the same place and wait for the next evictions. So a lot of our work in STI has been to stop evictions, to support people through evictions, to negotiate for long-term solutions. And to take and to bite the bullet to say that we will accept relocation if we cannot deal with this. So I want to bring into this conversation the challenges of addressing relocation, because very few organizations have experience of doing that. And it's never included in the loss and damage discussion. So either people have to move for their own safety or they have to move because they don't have a right to stay there and it depletes them. So. I feel that those are the kinds of contributions we can make, but we also feel that we, poor people are tired of being victims. We believe that they are the first responders and they don't get treated like that. So I'd like when, the, when you continue this to go into that. And the last part is, I have to do my yes, PR. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so we have a campaign called Roof Over Our Heads. It's a campaign that acknowledges that poor people design, construct, and finance their own homes, and it keeps getting destroyed and they have to do it again. So we are going to look at ways by which we produce much more robust, resilient homes within the affordability that they have initially, but subsequently work with various uh, commercial and uh, local organizations to start treating them like a market mm -hmm. and then go to the municipalities and their associations to say, aren't you ashamed of yourself that you talk, you go everywhere and talk about poor people in your neighborhood, you come back and you do that because we don't have a way of giving them tenure. So, but we said that is second. First, you have to survive. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Let's give uh, Sheila a hand. So I, I propose that we hear from all three of our panelists first, and then hopefully we'll have some time for some questions and, and comments. So over to uh, you, Ritu. Thanks, Salim. I'll let you introduce yourself. Yes, okay, <laughs> uh, thank you. So thank you, Salim. And uh, I'm Ritu Bharadwaj. I'm the principal researcher with the Climate Change Group at IID. And I'm, I'll be talking about, uh, I don't have uh, uh, all that, uh, 
very, very grounded practical experience like Sheila to share, but uh, we have a project, uh, a tool that we have developed where we are saying a people's plus tech approach. And this people's plus tech approach is essentially to deliver climate resilience through social protection program. So, you know, the, the program I'll be talking about is MGNR EGS, Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. There are some statistics there on the screen. Uh, it's essentially world's largest public works, works based social protection program, annual budget 11 billion reaches 250 million people. And it also has a component of guaranteeing 100 days of employment, wage employment to every rural household. You demand it, you don't get it, then you get covered to unemployment allowance. And then it also guarantees additional 50 days of employment if a drought of a severe category is declared. And with all this works, through it's a public works-based program. So the works that is used, it's then used to generate natural resource management assets. And these NRM assets in short, essentially are land development, soil conservation, moisture conservation, and those kind of structures. This program has been implemented for last 15 years. So you can imagine 15 years, $11 billion invested into the rural infrastructure on soil and moisture conservation, the rural landscape should have transformed by now. It hasn't. So the reason is much of these structures are built on an ad hoc manner here and there. But if it had been done in a proper way, we could have taken these communities towards a longer term water security and so on. So we tried to design this tool, which has essentially three components to it. So there's a drought early warning system. Uh, and the reason why we created this drought early warning system as a component of this tool was Typically, you know, the, the program has a component of providing additional 15 days of employment, but the drought gets declared three to four months after drought actually occurring, which means by then people who are in despair already undertake distress migration. By the time they are back, even if it is sanctioned, the financial year is towards the end, they can't avail it. The second is, as I said, you know, most of these structures are ad hoc in nature. So what we did, the second component of this tool is about doing a, a landscape-based planning, a rich to valley, a watershed-based approach. And this is by layering about nine layers of GIS uh, information along with climate information. And when I talk climate information, it's not about how the temperature is going to change, how the precipitation is going to change, because rural community can't make a head or tail out of that information. They need information like, is my groundwater going to deplete? Is, is the runoff going to increase? The thing, kind of information they can actually use for planning the agriculture or you know, allied activities. So this was again the second component. The third component is where we try to make the monitoring system work two ways. It shouldn't just work for the for the government officials to see, oh, where is my investment going? Is it being used properly? But rather for community to use it as a power to make sure that structures that are meant for them are built where it should be and of the quality that they need. And that's why this tool has this component of crowdsourcing data, monitoring data, where the community members themselves can geotag an asset click a picture and upload it. And if there's an incomplete structure, if there's a structure which has been put on the record that it's there, but it's not there, they can also click a picture about it and then upload it. The idea behind this tool is to convert crisis into opportunity, not always keep giving uh, relief during drought, but rather take them towards permanent drought proofing, flood resilience, and also take community towards a more longer term food and uh, nutrition security. One thing that I forgot to miss, mention is we have used state-of-the-art technology here. So we have used artificial intelligence. Uh, you can click anywhere on the map. It calculates the catchment of that particular location and then tells you which exact structure is best suited for that location. But it's not very top-down. This tool is more about both top-down because we're using technology, but also bottom-up. The power is in the hand of community to say, you know, these structures are okay, but no, I don't want these structures. I want to build something else here. And they can change it if they want it. While developing this tool, we made sure uh, that it's, it was co-designed with the government officials because there's no point developing state-of-the-art technology, which they can't use. The infrastructure does not permit. The people who are going to use that, they don't have the capacity. They don't have the technical knowledge. So this tool was very much designed in spirit and in every way with them. And that's why this, this tool is completely institutionalized within their system. The, the way in which we implemented this tool, yeah. So, you know, right now, one of the success factors of this tool is the government of India, we have implemented this pilot, tested this tool in two districts in Madhya Pradesh in India, but now government of India is scaling it up, right? In fact, we are in the process of developing a proposal as to how it can be scaled up pan-India level. 
we are also using now to try to see how this social protection program can be used to converge with informal labor market reform because as part of this work we are also looking into some of the non economic loss and damage such as you know farmer suicide uh, the distress migrant because migration has always been there it's a part of the livelihood package of the community but how do you make sure that there's some portability within the social protection uh, provision and also to see if there is an insurance payout mechanism can be clubbed with uh, this social protection program so in in the process of just quickly what i'll show you a few slides very quickly so when i my first slide said uh, people's plus tech approach so i just talked about technology not talked about the people so you know the success of this tool is very much people because without people it won't have succeeded and the way in which we scaled it up was using climate sathis or climate volunteers uh, or, or in real sense climate friends and these are people from within the community and uh, they 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 are trained on how to use the tool but then they uh, use it so they are you know to so this tool was launched about 2 years back and uh, we just try to capture some of the impact of how this tool is really looking on the ground first first kind of impact was on the gender intersectionality the, what this tool did was it gave uh, power to the people uh, to the women because we know all know that women play the so see you know these are the women who perform almost 60 to 70% of the work in the agriculture sector anyone who's worked in this space would know women are the one who perform most of that work but they never get the that role or decision making power when it comes to deciding where the structure should be built how it should be structured uh, built and these women you see all of them they like this lady i remember rukmini even i actually saw her in action in the village i thought god like she can really run for the president's election the way she commanded and the way she talked and i thought technology had given her an additional power because now she went she said that now when i go to the to the village meetings people look at me with awe and respect because i have information which people don't have and i i am able to guide them what they should be doing but we say women lead differently they don't keep the power to themselves they share it uh, and uh, there are just a few slides which i wanted to quickly run if it allows me so and then they even in india uh, you know there there are certain marginalized groups which are called scheduled caste and scheduled tribe they have been traditionally marginalized and this scheme gives additional provision a special provision for some of these structures to be built on their own private lands but they don't get their voice in the in the decision making the sub engineer would go and tell them oh your location is not suited for this structure now with this technology they know exactly they can go and demand for what uh, can be built so i'm just quickly flipping through uh, these are so so you know they were as the slide moves i'll just uh, see if it can uh, so there's some of the other areas where we saw this uh, this impact so uh, some of the other areas were early warning early action i'm sure ben it's your agenda uh, but uh, you know what we really saw that what, some of those areas are areas from where people traditionally migrate but what this did it's not it, it didn't stop them from migrating but what it did it give them gave them information much bef beforehand so they were not migrating in distress next slide so these are just some of the community and then it had as i said it help in uh, like landscape based planning which help in delivering longer term drought proofing yeah, yeah just yeah. so you know if you look at the agenda uh, in the agenda i didn't write my name because to a large extent i don't think i like we can claim the success for what happened with this tool and i feel really these are some of the things i have close to 20 years of experience but there are some things which really stuck with, stick with you because you think that you really did something uh good that it really touched people's uh life and these are some of these women who i think should be the ones to, who should have come here and talked about it and for me they are the real climate warriors and i just hope that uh, you know we are able to support them and to take some of these success to a, a larger scale up so over to thank you. you thank you very much ritu uh, let me now invite our third panelist inane are you with us Uh, I am. Can you hear From me? From Tier Fund. Uh, yes, please go ahead. 
Super, super. Thank you ever so much. Super. So um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. It's good to see a few familiar faces online and in the room. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person, but it's good to be with others in solidarity online from all over the world. Um, my name's Inoni, Inoni Chadburn, and I'm Head of Humanitarian and Resilience at Tier Fund. Uh, but in actual fact, Tier Fund is part of the START Network, and I'm here today representing the START Network. I, I found it with interest that Sheila said quite early on, uh, it's only when you create large networks that you get energy. Uh, and Start Network is a collaborative of over 80 international and national based organizations coming together uh, because they believe in systems change for humanitarian situations, including the fact that I personally feel it's uh, immoral that you wait for a disaster impact to happen uh, and you do not support communities to be able to seek uh, opportunities to protect and serve themselves and uh, self-determine their own outcomes uh, with humanitarian financing in advance of uh, a particular event from happening. Because we know in this day and age, we have technological understanding uh, and a real sense of insight into what could trigger uh, new and emerging crises. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about uh, Start Ready. Um, but just to give you a bit of insight, START has actually got two sides of its work. Uh, it has got um, the START funds. You may know us best with START funds, which is rapid, flexible, pool contingency funding, funding for dynamic decision making for small to medium scale crises. Uh, but then you've also got um, START Ready, which is predictable triggered funding at scale for foreseeable crises using risk analysis, collective planning and scientific modeling. Uh, and that's what I want to just push into a little bit for you today. So what is Start Ready? So I'm sorry, this is a very complicated slide. Can I also just tell you uh, some of the things that we have to do to support communities around anticipation are quite complex. And that is actually the challenge and one of the challenges that I do want to share with you as we go throughout. But we've got two sides of the screen here. You've got one where you have pooling and one which you have no pooling. So what Start Ready is, is a risk pool. Uh, and that says uh, on the left, you can see where it says no pooling. Maybe you have uh, four different bilateral donors who commit to certain countries. We have Bangladesh, Pakistan, Philippines, or Madagascar. And they say they want to support uh, either in terms of anticipation or even in terms of uh, emergency response, those countries for the hazards that they face into. And now they happen every one in two years, one in four years. Uh, but you can see there's a decompartmentalization of the funding. Now, if you go over to the one on the right, you can see by pooling it, we're able to stretch the money to actually cover and provide social protection to up to uh, one million more. And um, that's because we're using uh, a sense of, uh, of risk analytics. We're using statistical modeling to be able to say, well, hang on a minute, uh, that one in two year event is going to mean that not all of that money is used all at the same time. Uh, and if you uh, to look at it another way uh, is saying that you have the funding held uh, in the non pooled is 20 million. But the funding you need to pool is actually in the pooled fund is actually only 4.5 million because it's your worst case scenario is that 20 million is needed. But there is less than a 0.01 percent chance of that happening in any one year. So even if you only hold 4.5 million, you're guaranteeing a pooled fund of 20 million. And that's a little bit hard for people to get their head around. And it may include it. I'm no mathematician. I'm no statistician. I do not work in the insurance industry. Uh, and all it is, is that I have a heart for communities who are affected by disasters on a regular basis, time and time again. So it takes a lot of thinking to work this through. But let me see if I can explain a little bit more as we go through. So we are at the end of our first year of our first pool, uh, and we had an efficiency ratio of 1.6, which means that we stretched the capital to cover and socially protect 280,000 people across six countries, covering eight risks. Uh, and uh, that was stretched, the 2.68 million capital was stretched to be able to cover the equivalent of 3.4 million. 
And the activations that we had in pooled one were for a multiple of different hazards. We had heat waves uh, three times in Pakistan. We had drought in Zimbabwe. We had drought in Senegal, cyclone in Madagascar, drought in uh, Somalia, and riverine and fluvial flooding in DRC. Uh, and notice the, the terminology here, uh, as we learned to, uh, as part of our journey as the Governance Committee of Start, uh, of Start Ready, uh, we learned to the differences between pluvial flooding and fluvial flooding and how you're protecting and you're using your statistical modeling and you're triggering based on all of those aspects to be able to get you what, what you need. And it is quite a complex process. So the way that we work with communities is absolutely front and center of what we do. We want to make sure that these are nationally held systems and embedded and built and created by local communities and local NGOs who know and understand the lie of the land, the regular hazards they faced. And I think, um, you know, again, it was Sheila who said, uh, we communities have long and deep experiences of coping with crisis. And this is exactly what we see as well. So you can see there's many different steps uh, to the process that are both at the global level and at the national level. But the most important thing is that the actual uh, system is built by the communities themselves. They assess what risk they're vulnerable to. They assess how much money they need to draw down on point of crisis. They create a contingency plan and it's then able to be dispersed. So we're now moving into our risk pool two, uh, and it's exciting for us. We only kicked it off in the last uh, two months, but again, we've already had drawdowns for heat waves in Pakistan. You can see the multitude of countries that we actually cover in, in this. Um, and you can see that this time, because donors are beginning to get their head around it, we, we've, got a, we've got a larger pool and it's exciting for us. Um, so we are having to be, we are able to stretch it to even more countries. Uh, and this time we weren't able to secure a reinsurance limit, but let me tell you a little bit about the reinsurance. When we, if there is that 0.01% chance of all the money being drawn down, we don't actually hold that capital. So one of the things we need to do is also hold uh, an, uh, a reinsurance product, which is a little bit of funding we buy within from the insurance industry to make sure that we have the extra capital to be able to serve all of the communities that we, we want to serve. And you can see here, this is the seasonal calendar. So there are times of year when we actually have a greater vulnerability for drawdown up to a high number. And we have to do an awful lot of statistical modeling that we would have the right available capital at the right place at the right time to be able to disperse appropriately to the national mechanisms. So it was a five minute quick whistle stop tour of what we do as Start Ready. Um, but I just want to pick up on, on some of the issues that we need to push into, some of the challenges and some of the ways we want to do business. So we do realize that uh, we need to address vulnerability appropriately. Um, we're looking at triggers that demonstrate where an impact of a hazard has happened on, uh, on a, across the whole of a community. But how do we pick out those who are most vulnerable from the impact of that hazard rather than doing a blanket event? And we need to do some work to actually drill down on that and work better with our national partners to be able to secure that. Um, as I've alluded to quite a bit throughout this, it's complex and it requires commitment, scale and expertise. But here's the thing. It is an extraordinarily interesting and a very uh important tool I think that we could multiply scale up and utilize in many different countries and locations globally and it doesn't need to uh, we, we've begun to build up a whole packages of tools and resources that can work with different countries in different locations what we need though is flexible donor funding that's and it's hopefully linking it back more effectively to climate finance. At the moment, we're drawing down on humanitarian pools of funding, which means that they want to say, we need to show that this is dispersed by a certain date. When with the risk pool one, they wanted us to spend down as much as we could to the very end and the edge of the pool. And to be able to predict that appropriately was extraordinarily difficult. But we did manage it in the first year. We were probably a bit too austere. And we've actually pushed out our risk a little bit more this year and taking it really further to the edge in our analysis and our in our statistical data uh, our understanding of how we want to use the pool. 
Final two points are we want to continue to uh, embed this as nationally and as locally owned mechanism as possible. We want to be able to demonstrate that we don't have to use heavy, you know, intersets of mean intermediaries. We can get this down to as locally as possible via um, uh, just this simple pooled mechanism and by having this networked approach that we can all use global expertise alongside that real sense of understanding and insight from the communities who are affected by climate disasters and to come together to actually make sure that we can actually take really take, take this to the next level. And the final thing I wanted to say is that this isn't the only tool in the box. And I think that's also really important to see. We, we can't address all risks with this, this approach. One of the things that Start Network needs to push into more is actually having a diverse cross-section of different financing mechanisms to be able to support nationally-led responses to different kind of climate risks that are coming. So it is it is complicated, it requires investment, it requires commitment, but it's certainly doable and it's certainly exciting. So uh, watch this space for what else happens over the coming months and years. Thank you. And this second session, we'll be looking at how do we move to scale. Um, so we've heard some of the solutions that are out there. Now we want to hear how do we really scale them up? Um, and so it's a great pleasure uh, to be able to introduce very esteemed panel we have um hopefully dr christopher white bartlett who is head of climate diplomacy with the government of vanuatu i just think what time it is in vanuatu at the moment um, but dr christopher will hopefully be joining us we have kishan kuma singh who is head of the mea unit which is the multilateral environmental agreement unit within the ministry of planning and development in trinidad and tobago uh, we have Ambassador Diane Black Lane, who's the Director of the Department of the Environment of Antigua and Barbuda. Um, and she's also Antigua and Barbuda's Ambassador for Climate Change and heavily involved in the Transitional Committee on Loss and Damage. Um, and then we also have Malek uh, Silvasi, who's Senior Program Manager <laughs> on Climate Justice with the Open Society Foundation. Um, so we have the same two questions for all of our speakers on this panel. So let me just read out those questions and then we'll go to, to each speaker individually. So the questions are, number one, how, how has your government organisation been scaling up efforts to address the impacts of climate change in recent years? And what have you learned through that process? And the second question, because we know that this isn't only a government responsibility, it's not only state actors. We have to have a whole society approach. So how can we involve civil society and NGOs like she was mentioning earlier? How do we make this a whole society approach? So first of all, let me hand over to Dr. Christopher Barnett. Can you hear us okay, Chris? You are on Fantastic. Well, warm greetings to you all from the people in the government of Vanuatu. I'm really pleased to join you uh, in this event. Let me say that um, scaling up action is truly what is needed right now because we are absolutely out of time. I'm gonna take us a little bit back uh, to the early 1990s when Vanuatu as the co-founding chair of AOSIS asked the developed world to make available funding to help our island communities actually scale up what they were already doing to try to address loss and damage from sea level rise. Now let's fast forward to now, 2023, the international community still has not mobilized a coordinated response to that request in, in the form of the fund or in other forms. But despite this, Vanuatu has and will continue to act to address loss and damage, and we will scale up that action nationally. So about 10 years ago, we began to scale up this action by decentralizing uh, loss and damage work, the assessments, the planning, and the implementation of action down to as many local level actors as possible. And we did this by promoting the establishment of community uh, climate uh, disaster and climate change committees. So these committees are made up of village chiefs, uh, church authorities, men, women, youth, people with disabilities, and uh, they hold a mandate to do this long-term uh, risk planning and ca capacity development for slow onset and rapid onset events and post-disaster need assessment. Uh, very importantly, the work of these CDCCCs is formally recognized in our disaster management systems. 
Uh, their roles and their responsibilities are in fact written into our national standard operating procedures. The other very unique thing about these CDCCCs is that they are directly experiencing the nuanced slow onset impacts as well as the non-economic loss and damage impacts. And that means they have the knowledge and the solutions uh, required uh, based on their context. So now we have CDCs across the country and they are requesting and receiving tailored and on-demand technical assistance from, as well as finance, from a range of NGOs, uh, businesses, and OBNEs who are working in those areas. And this is possible because our government and non-government community work very closely together. In fact, our uh, NGOs have uh, joined as part of the Vanuatu Climate Action Network and our business community as part of the Vanuatu Business Resilience Council, all to provide direct support to these CDCCCs. And in fact, because of this coordination, these uh, networks now have a formal seat on the decision-making table of the national government, which is the National Advisory Board for Disaster uh, Climate Change and Disastrous Reduction. So the key message here is that Vanuatu's nationally defined system for addressing and scaling up loss and damage is actually premised on a whole of government and on a whole of society approach. And it formally includes community, the CDCs themselves, as well as our non-government stakeholders into our institutional arrangements so that we can flexibly design uh, and implement and scale the loss and damage solutions that are most appropriate uh, and contextualized. Let me give one uh, final example about scaling action in Vanuatu. One of the questions that we hear over and over again is, what exactly do you want to fund with loss and damage funds? And how is this different from the adaptation and humanitarian funding that's already available? So rather than continuing to speak in the abstract, Vanuatu, and in fact, most Pacific Island countries have been very concrete in describing what it is uh, that's required to scale. And uh, we were one of the first countries to put uh, loss uh, and damage into our nationally determined contribution as a standalone section. And there you'll find 12 uh, very tangible and concrete, fully costed uh, commitments and solutions. So for example, uh, our L&D commitment number four speaks to uh, doing loss and damage needs assessments uh, that build on non-economic loss and damage and slow onset indicators. So working with what the CDCs are already doing, but helping to add on these uh, additional assessments. Our loss and damage uh, NDC commitment number six, which is about 20 million US dollars, uh, focuses on rolling out micro insurance with the private sector uh, to support our subsistence fisher folk and farmers. So what this is demonstrating is that we are already planning uh, within this kind of mosaic of uh, solutions that exist and a, a mosaic of actors already planning how we can uh, scale up um, these solutions that uh, that have already been identified at the community level. So in our view, scaling really does require cooperative solutions. We cannot keep getting stuck in this dilemma of, well, I'll only act if you act first. Uh, we all have to act. And that's why uh, Vanuatu is so proud to be a part of the All Act uh, program that we heard about earlier. Um, look, we know that Vanuatu and the other Pacific SIDS uh, and so many vulnerable countries are not responsible uh, for the greenhouse gas emissions, the fossil fuel production that's causing loss and damage, but we are acting and we are scaling up that action. And so in our view, it's time to see this level of commitment from all parties and all non-party stakeholders because more is desperately needed uh, to support these locally designed solutions. Uh, no one is immune. Uh, Vanuatu is not a member of the transitional committee that is now working on uh, some of these proposals and solutions. So I very much thank you for allowing us to voice some of these concrete proposals, and we hope they make it into the uh, pre presentations at, at COP28 and the proposals submitted. But uh, look, know that in Vanuatu, you continue to have uh, one of the highest ambition allies for anybody who is dedicated to protecting the most vulnerable um, from climate harm and scaling up practical, effective, and locally-led loss and damage action. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Christopher. Really helpful presentation and very concise to the point as well. Maybe given that you've gone through so rapidly, let me just take the opportunity quickly to ask you a question because I know it's late at your end as well um, and you may need to, to jump offline. But 
out of all of what you've learned so far, out of those excellent examples that you have, what would be your top piece of advice or top tip for other governments who are who are attempting to achieve scale? Like out of all all the lessons that you've learned, which is the top one, would you say? Well, great. Well, let me give you um, all three kind of in summary. The first is that we've got to use these national systems that are whole of society approach and acknowledging that it's more than just governments or more than NGOs or humanitarian actors. Uh, the second one is that we've got to um, define what we're going to do and scale uh, and then commit to funding it like Vanuatu's done with our own national budgets and our NDC. And then the third one is that we all have to act. There isn't any more waiting. It's everybody has to do now everything that's possible. Thanks so much, Christopher. Okay, um, let us move on to Kishan Kumasing um, from Trinidad and Tobago. Kishan, can you hear us okay? Yes, uh, good Good morning from where I am. Um, and, and, and thank you, uh, Tom, Ritu, Salim, and IIED for the opportunity once again um, to share my thoughts on this uh, emerging and important issue. Before I start, let me also um, uh, thank the previous panel uh, and, and Christopher as well on this panel for sort of setting the stage for what um, I'm about to say because I'm I will draw on some of those presentations. I do not have a formal presentation, um, so bear with me on that one as well. Um, as I have said before, uh, with the evolving work on loss and damage now with the decision to um, establish funding arrangements and a fund and the transitional committee now uh, deliberating on what the architecture of that fund and those arrangements could be. Um, one of the things that I, I think in responding to the question uh, that can work simultaneously or in tandem with scaling up national um, national efforts uh, is the need, and I've said this before, is the need to, um, in the context of the international funding arrangements now, the need at the national level and even at the subnational level and community level uh, to develop some kind of approach or some kind of methodology um, for quantifying loss and damage. Uh, there is, uh, and this, this has to, to include both extreme uh, events and, and slow onset events, because with each manifestation of, of climate change impacts, there will always be some kind of residual loss and some kind of residual damage. And I think that uh, coming up with some kind of methodology, some kind of tailored approach at the national level or the subnational level or even the community level or sectoral level um, to assess uh, or, and quantify uh, those, um, those losses and damages uh, would be a critical first step to gather the empirical kind of evidence that will now be needed, I assume, in future um, for making the case for funding. Um, we heard from previous panelists um, the, the, the case for targeted funding and fit for purpose and so on. Uh, and where would these uh, uh, funds be placed? And I think I'm drawing on Christopher's last point. Um, so I think some kind of um, approach, some kind of methodology for quantifying both the, uh, the direct economic losses as well as the non-economic losses, because they are, they are economic approaches and methodologies for, for assessing non-economic um, losses as well. Uh, which cannot be quantified. So uh, I, I think as a first step or in tandem or simultaneous with um, scaling up uh, loss and damage efforts at the, at the national level, uh, we need this kind of uh, structured approach, uh, so this kind of empirical uh, evidence gathering uh, to make the case uh, so that we are not uh, speaking, um, you know, sort of uh, from an opinion-based uh, perspective, and I heard the first panelist uh, allude to the fact that, that sometimes the people say, no, you don't know what you're talking about, and sometimes they don't take you seriously, and so on. So I think uh, in ga gathering that that kind of empirical evidence uh, from, an, uh, from a, a quantifiable approach uh, is critical. Um, the, the second thing I, I think um, that needs to be incorporated in the loss and damage um, conversation uh, is, the, is the issue of just transition. Uh, and I can only share our own um, experiences and our own approaches on just transition. Uh, we have developed a draft just, just transition policy, uh, which is now before the cabinet uh, awaiting approval. And the next step, of course, would be to uh, develop an implementation plan um, for implementing the just transition. And it's not it's not only restricted to uh, the the low carbon 
or the energy transition and the, the expected and the unintended consequences that may arise from that from a labor perspective, but also uh, in keeping with the no one left behind uh, principle of looking at disenfranchisement, um, uh, of loss of livelihoods uh, and of loss of income from the direct impacts of climate change. Uh, and this would invariably involve uh, issues related to loss and damage uh, as well. Uh, and so the just transition uh, equation also has to uh, include loss and damage uh, as, a, as a variable. Uh, and this is how we have been approaching that. Um, uh, how we have also been approaching adaptation or, uh, is, is perhaps um, instructive to, uh, to share as well. Um, our approach to adaptation has not been, um, has not been one that is project-based based on long-term uh, adaptation, uh, uh, primarily because uh, the, the temperature at which, you know, the, the earth will settle at towards the end of the century is still a moving goalpost, and it will be foolhardy to plan uh, or benchmark uh, any temperature uh, goal at, you know, on which uh, vulnerability is to be assessed and therefore plan for adaptation. So our approach has been more of a pathways approach looking at, um, at assessing climate risks at, at all levels, uh, subnational sectoral community levels, um, and formulating responses to those risks um, uh, and responding to them. And then when the climate impact manifests itself again, whether it's drought or whether it's uh, flooding or extreme weather events, to evaluate those uh, resiliency um, approaches and then tweak them of course, bearing in mind and keeping an eye on long-term adaptation. Um, so it's a pathways approach to, to building climate resiliency um, through uh, a risk management or climate risk management uh, approach. Um, and, and to that end, um, what we have been doing is really uh, as, a, as, a, as an approach to scaling up and truly integrating climate risk in the national development um, paradigm is to train uh, local government bodies, the subnational government uh, bodies, um, the community level uh, 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 bodies to uh, to assess climate risks because every sector, every uh, community is different and would have a different um, vulnerability profile and therefore a, a different sort of loss and damage risk that may arise uh, either from extreme weather events or from slow onset events. So for example, here in Trinidad, we have we have communities that are dependent on natural resources uh, near the coast or on the coast, uh, as well as communities high up in the hills. And, and of course, you could uh, easily um, you know, fathom that, that they would have different, extremely different vulnerability profiles and therefore loss and damage uh, um, potential and risks. So uh, what we have been doing to scale up and to integrate is really uh, to afford or to empower these local government bodies, which have responsibilities for various jurisdictions um, within their remit uh, to assess climate risks um, within their jurisdiction to um, to also um, quantify what those risks may be because it, this will feed into the national budget uh, requirements as well uh, and as well uh, to inform uh, international multilateral financing for for loss and damage not only from an extreme weather event uh, perspective but also from a uh, from a slow onset, whether that manifests itself as drought, as 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 food production limitations, as crop yields, as health impacts, and uh, you know social costs and so on. Um, so that is how we are doing the scaling up from a bottom up approach uh, to empowerment and, and capacity building. Uh, but again, I, I wanted to underscore the need for a structured approach, um, and I want to repeat my call that I have done uh, on this forum uh, before uh, for, for an approach to look at asset management, um, to look at resiliency of, of hard infrastructures uh, and the soft uh, systems as well, and, and how they can withstand um, climate risks. Uh, and this, of course, is in keeping with the accepted, now accepted uh, broad definition of loss and damage in, in terms of averting and minimizing um, so that um, uh, attention and focus can be can be made on on those assets uh, that are particularly at high risk to to, to climate events, uh, and therefore, uh, as far as possible, 
quantify what those uh, uh, risks can be when a particular climate uh, uh, event manifests itself, whether it's a, an extreme weather event or, or slow onset, which will have to be revisited uh, going forward, consistent with our pathways approach. So um, I'll, I'll leave it there uh, for now. Um, uh, that is, has been our approach, and 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 the uh, again coupled with uh, with the requirements for building that requisite capacity to address loss and damage from a more structured and empirical approach rather than um, subjective, uh, you know, sort of uh, semi qualitative. Uh, evidence. So uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Willing to address any questions that may arise. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kishan. Thank you. For me, standing out, you can see how relevant the Ministry of Planning and Development in this case, but equivalent departments around the world are so critical on this agenda to integrate into those longer term plans. Um, let's move on and then see if we have time for questions towards the end. But Ambassador Diane Black Lane, from Antigua and Barbuda. I know that you've been heavily involved in scaling up efforts um, nationally for, for a number of years now. Can we turn to you in terms of how, how you've managed to do that, what you're working on currently, uh, the lessons you've learned, and also how civil society has a role to play from, from your perspective? Can you hear us okay, Diane? Diane, are you online with us? If not, then we will move on to, to Marek and come back to Ambassador Diane Black Lane in, in a moment. Um, Marek, can I turn to you for the, the same questions, please? Hi, Ben. Can you hear me fine? We can, yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much. I'm really honored to be, uh, to be with you today. I will try to respect the time. Uh, I'm working in the Open Society Foundations and the Climate Justice Program. and. Um, my foundation is, uh, we need to be honest that we are a rather latecomer to the climate change space. It's been about one and a half year only that we systematically start working on, on, on climate, although before we've been funding climate work, but not in a systematic manner. And uh, we've been since uh, trying to like evaluate our strategic niche and comparative advantage for effective impact. Uh, and there is something we're bringing in from from the from our other areas of work. We our focus on human rights, inclusion, participation, transparency, or accountability, and that's why we decided in the foundation not to set up a, a climate change program, but uh, from the very onset, look at the justice elements to to climate politics. Uh, and in that, we're bringing in like a, an OSF legacy, which is very much a uh, focus on the protection of climate and environmental defenders, working against uh, anti OT, working as authoritarian politics and bringing, as I said, human rights and people-centered approaches. And uh, what is very specific for us, also our work, it's a uh, focus on vulnerable states, communities, and specifically in global south. So out of this, uh, uh, our strategic thinking uh, has been that we concentrate on, on and our funding and our effort on working on climate resilience and loss and damage. And this has been since our inception and the initial pledge the foundation made at the COP26 in, in Glasgow, where we joined uh, the Scottish government and pledged uh, some, some loss and damage funding. How we, how we operationalize or this, uh, think about uh, this, uh, the strategic focus is uh, we have, uh, three streams. One is uh, specifically loss and damage funding arrangements and funding, but within that space, we also very much looking into the issues of climate mobility and displacement. We also put our funding and resources to uh, catalyzing adaptation through blended finance. And we also look at the climate effective multilateralism and transform transformation of the system climate influence in depthness. So these are our key deliveries on, on loss and damage where we where the foundation is is moving. So and in general, what our work is to trigger is a set of reforms within the global and multilateral financial institutions, especially in the UN system and what we call Bretton Woods institutions and institutional investors to equip vulnerable nations and communities with the resources and safeguards, they need to address loss and damage and tackle climate impacts with dignity. And so we've been witnessing uh, uh, quite a 
uh, an impact on, at the last COP, where the, not only because of the loss and damage uh, fund, the funding arrangements announcement, but also how the uh, how it was ushered in a, in an era of multilateral development, banks reforms, and climate lenses, and we've been very much following that those processes as well and supporting our partners. And here I'm. I recognize that most of our focus is indeed on, on, on global and multilateral environment, but uh, what we try to do and what is our key, key element is to bring those uh, voices of vulnerable communities and states that need to be heard in these processes and uh, building the capacities and, and, and helping to, to open access. And just to give one example perhaps of this work, a few We've been supporting uh, V20 in setting up uh, their own office in, uh, in Washington, so they're closer to those uh, institutions of global capital, uh, like World Bank or IMF. We've been supporting uh, some of the small island states or least developed countries in, in the UNFCCC processes and building, trying to provide some uh, resources for uh, technical expertise. We've been, of course, since uh, this one and a half year supporting uh, civil society and uh, and research institutes in, in the loss and damage space to provide some some input, especially for the for the work of transitional committee. Um, so I think even when we operate in this uh, multilateral, which is most like uh, most often state to state driven process, we are trying to bring in the the voice of communities and CSOs in 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 those processes. Um, right, and so perhaps like when when it comes. The closest though, is the work on, on the climate mobility and displacement, where we try to really uh, have, have communities uh, in, uh, in the whole consultation processes when it comes to the plan relocations or the, the mobility path. So their dignity and their solutions, their voices and their knowledge is, is being, being uh, respected and in the, in, in the, in the design of, of those, uh, those processes. Last thing, and just in this very sketchy contribution, I would say that we obviously we are a grant making foundation where we distribute resources, but we also have uh, you know, some other uh, tools. What we use, we have a you know, impact investment department where we like try to try to bring more uh, you know, de, -esca de escalations or more de risking elements to to climate funding. We have a justice initiative uh, colleagues who are working on, on on legal tools, including litigations or providing legal advice to to, to to our partners. And we also have a specific advocacy department that is working with opening the access for, for our partner. So I would stop here because of shortness of the time, but really appreciate for having a space to to talk about our our work. Thank you. Thanks, Merrick. Thanks so much. Thanks for, you, for sharing your, your thoughts and um, what is standing out to me is some of the elements that we need to consider for scaling up. So the legal aspects, the policy and the planning, the financing, then the human elements, the capacity to be able to deliver this. Um, I don't think that Ambassador Diane Black Lane has been able to, to join us, um, but we do have a whole other panel to turn to. So um, I won't ask questions right now but thank you so much for joining uh, to all of our panelists in that session um, let me hand over to the next moderator um, Claire Clement from the British Red Cross over to you Claire thanks Ben and I'm just going to invite Gemma to come and join me on the stage seamless handover from moderator to moderator um, so, yeah, thank you, for Ben, to, for introducing me. I'm Claire Clement. I'm Director of International Law and Policy here at the British Red Cross. It's lovely to be hosting you all in here. I keep having slight conniptions about all the technology, so I hope I think it's working okay. Thank you to my wonderful team for fixing it in real time as we go along. So thanks for putting up with, with the slight hitches here. It's really appreciated. So this is the final sub-panel we have. Um, we've had a really good look so far at the types of practical actions that we can take. Um, we're now going to have a take a look. We're going to take a look look rather at how we are, how we can and how we should be financing these actions. Um, it's so often the critical question, as we know. I'm delighted to have representatives from three different governments here to explore this with us. So we're going to look across financing options such as climate funds, grants, loans, innovative financing models, including finance for anticipatory actions, social protection programs. We're also going to look at the challenges associated with accessing and mobilising financial resources 
resources and transferring it to the community level. So this is an element that's been a really strong thread across the panels today, and it's an area in which British Red Cross has certainly been looking at um, closely. So let me introduce our three speakers to you. Um, on the stage with me here, I have Gemma Tanner, who's the Senior Adaptation Advisor at the UK's Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO. On the screen, I'm hoping we have Catherine Simonet, who is our Adaptation Lead at Agence France de Développement. I have just completely butchered your mother tongue. Apologies for that. So from AFD, Catherine, lovely to see you there. Ooh, you are there. Um, and then third, we have Sinead Walsh, who is the Climate Director at the Department of Foreign Affairs for the Government of Ireland. And you're there as well. It is working beautifully. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to ask all of you a couple of questions. I was going to do this in the round, but I think given the technology and, and the timing as well, I might ask each of you the two questions at once if that's okay. So if it's all right, Catherine, Sinead, we'll start here in the room. Um, we'll start with Gemma. So Gemma, the two questions I have for you are, first of all, could you share with us some examples of successful financial mechanisms that support practical action um, to reach the most vulnerable communities um, and that support the inclusion of communities as well, in particular marginalised groups um, in decision making? And then once you've shared with us any examples you might have, it would be great um, to understand from you how you think we can scale up these sorts of successful models and approaches and what lessons or challenges that we might need to bear in mind. So one is the examples, the next is the scale up and challenges. Over to you, Gemma. Thanks. Great. And um, thank you very much, Claire. And thank you, everyone. Um, it's always hard to come on after two great panels that have really focused on the real solutions and the real work on the ground. And um, many of the examples I've been thinking about have actually been referenced today. <laughs> and I don't want to get in detail when the real experts are sitting in front of me. Um, but I think, you know, when we look at things that we can learn from, I think particularly the early warning, early action area is particularly an exciting one because it starts to really bring together development, climate and humanitarian action on the ground. Um, we can look to cruise as an example and WISER, the UK funded program with the Met Office, which I think, not saying we're getting everything right, but I think in the early warning space, we there is final real recognition of the need to involve communities, not just as recipients of the information, but also part of the, the co-design, and that's the only way we will get success. In terms of scaling up the finance, for example, in Cruz, they have the work with the GCF to look how they can actually increase flows of funding through the GCF process to those sort of projects. And that's going to be critical is trying to find ways and mechanisms that can link the different streams of finance that are available. Um, the increasing fragmentation of the financial system is a challenge. Um, and how we do that better at the international level and the national level, I think is going to have to be a focus of all of us working in this area going forward. And um, I wanted to also talk about innovation, because I think we've talked a lot about how important it is to build on what we know and what works. And that's completely right. But at the same time, I think, as I've said, we're in a new world now in terms of both temperature and challenges. Also in terms of technology and what that offers, um, I think from a financing point of view, that raises up a number of challenges because donors need to be patient and we need to do risk taking. So I think, you know, we have examples of that, like the Braced programme, the UK funded, which funded a whole range of looking at how you can devolve finance down at different levels. Different models worked, some didn't, but we learnt. And I think it's the flocker. I can't remember what that stands for, but that example in Kenya is showing that that actually you can pick up that innovation and learn. But the real challenge is how we get that sort of evidence and learning out of these bits of innovation and bring them together in a way that can match up with that finance and those multiple finance streams at scale. Um, so I think that would be my key message to take away. We need to build up what's working, but also find that space to innovate and really work at bringing the examples and the hard evidence to the place where the finance is available. Thanks.
Great. Thanks, Gemma. Thanks for um, pointing to some of those examples we have that increasingly, I guess, look to better community participation, um, including in the co-design and also pointing out some of the problems that we still face in terms of innovation challenges. Fragmentation of the system um, is a critical one as well. Turning to Catherine now, if that's okay, um, for your take on these two critical questions around whether you can share with us some successful examples um, of financing models that you think have worked, in particular to get funding to that critical community slash local level. Um, and then based on that, what, how, what are the opportunities here for scaling up those types of models? Um, and what challenges do we face and lessons we should be learning? Thanks, Catherine, over to you. Thank you, and thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm really happy to, to participate to the, this exchange, and it's been really interesting. And the two first panels on solution were really instructive for us. From I have this perspective, I think the the main point uh, to for all of you is that we are a development bank, so we are part of the French climate team and we are funding climate and development activities. But we also are not directly engaged in climate climate negotiations, and we are implementing and funding solution and reaching the most vulnerable and marginalized communities. Uh, um, can be a challenge because uh, as a development bank, our traditional partners are mostly national, regional institutions, and our tools cannot be always adapted to support local action. But nonetheless, uh, IFD uh, is also funding some activities and supporting progress on aid uh, localization. Uh, we have dedicated tools that specifically target <coughs> fragile population and support aid localization. For instance, uh, we do have a fund supporting um, organization of so civil societies and NGOs in uh, calls for proposal, through calls for proposals. And we have a fund that is dedicated to peace building called MINCA, and that uh, encompasses a pillar specially dedicated to aid localization. I do think also that uh, it's important to mention that we have a huge experience in funding local regional institutions and that these projects are anchored on the decentralization, devolution processes, which um, are systematically, they are not systematically taking into account climate vulnerability, but they represent a really important uh, background work that we are doing with a political dialogue, local communities, and um, on the local action. So we can build up on all this experience and dialogue for introducing climate actions. This is, uh, for instance, what we are doing on uh, a basket fund, a proper basket fund in Rwanda, uh, which is a, a project co-funded with KFW. And we are working with the Ministry of Local Government in, uh, uh, with the support of the Global Center on Adaptation in order to integrate climate uh, dimensions within an existing fund uh, of decentralization and for uh, basket fund. We also work on adaptive social protection where we found a lot of opportunities with the World Bank. Uh, we find a lot of opportunities for targeting the most vulnerable in an appropriate ways. Uh, I do think that we also need to um, uh, improve the knowledge we have on uh, what is needed in the ground and especially with this uh, emergency of uh, loss and damage needs. And uh, I, I do uh, with a project on Adapt Action, which is a program dedicated to, uh, especially dedicated to adaptation and working in 12 countries in uh, Africa. We are funding with uh, IED, uh, a research program that aim to assess what are the needs in Senegal when adaptation is reaching some limits. And uh, I do think that this is also, uh, is also a way for us to improve our knowledge and to really experience and innovate in terms of uh, activities that we can fund, especially again, as a development bank where our tools can be a bit different and, um, and various. Regarding your second question about uh, how to scale up and the lessons and challenges to be in mind, uh, I think that it's important to recognize the necessity to be really context specific and as such the scaling up can be not so easy that we would like and um, there is a need for recognizing there is discontinuity in the scales of actions and the, repl the replicability is not so easy so defining suitable sol solution will 
always, and even if we have such kind of successful model, and I've been involved in my previous work on braced activities, and that was also one of our braced uh, lessons, uh, even if we have really nice pilot and really nice uh, solutions, the, the scaling up of action will require expertise and time. We need to have dedicated meals, means sorry, for uh, technical assistance, for capacity building. And this is something we are pushing a lot at the French Development Agency to really dedicate financial and also human means to uh, uh, payload this, um, this solution. We also uh, find that uh, it's necessary to have a mosaic of tools in order to best respond to the context and the challenges. And this is with a layering solution, with taking into account the multidimensionality of vulnerabilities and the different scales of action that we will be able to provide a robust uh, solution. And finally, I will echo what Gemma mentioned about the importance of coordination. Uh, we do foresee that uh, solution will not come from one uh, partners and one unique solution. It will be the coordination between climate finance, but also between the different actors, private sectors, public sectors, development actors, that will uh, help us to, to coordinate and uh, provide the, the relevant responses and the level of uh, response that we need. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Catherine, for those comments. Um, obviously, a lot of richness in there, but in particular, noting your point around, as we're looking to scale up these examples, the need to remain very context specific. And we've obviously heard a lot of practical actions from different contexts today. So how do we actually feasibly, sensibly scale that up while maintaining um, that context specific approach is, is an interesting one. Um, Sinead, over to you in terms of your, your thoughts on these two questions. So just a reminder, the first around sharing with us some examples. Of successful financial mechanisms as you see it and the second one around how we might scale these up and the, and the challenges we might face in doing so thanks over to you thanks a lot and and i think uh, i know we're very uh short of time but but uh happily i think uh Catherine and, and and Gemma um have, have mentioned uh some things that i might have otherwise mentioned so so I, i'll try to be quick um i suppose like uh like some other uh countries today uh ireland is sitting on the transitional committee um and so it's 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 just really good to be getting uh you know kind of insights from these kind of events to to feed into that um, I mean, I might be, you know, slightly um, provocative and 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 sort of uh, question the question uh, a little bit because uh, one of my concerns, uh, frankly, uh, about the climate finance uh, sector, which is a very fast growing sector, um, is that there is uh, like as in as in the development humanitarian sectors where where I sort of come from, um, there is a great tendency to jump to conclusions about certain initiatives which sound good and which say you know we are serving vulnerable communities and we are being participatory and so on, um, and without waiting for the evidence. So I, I I'm finding um, you know the climate sector is is uh, is 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 quite prone to to trends and I think that's just something we need to be very careful of and, and sort of maybe jumping to to the second question first, I think, um, you know, one of the principles is we need to be very tough with ourselves about evaluation and evidence, because almost every initiative says, you know, we're really serving communities and et cetera, et cetera. We're, we're really meeting the, the felt needs. Um, but actually, when we evaluate, we often see something that's quite uh, that's quite different. Um, you know, I think it's 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 obviously good that that climate finance is is increasing quite rapidly. We, we're actually in the process of, of doubling uh, in, in Ireland in, in, in a three and a half year period. So it's it's it's, uh, you know, it's obviously something that I see as positive, but it also does um, does concern me that we sometimes hear nice principles and then we associate that with with practice. Um, and, and I think that's quite a big jump. And so. Uh, I, I liked, uh, you know, listening to to Yononi talking about how this work is complicated. I think let's not run uh, away from that. Uh, reaching communities is actually one of the most complicated things uh, that you can do. Um, so so let, let's uh, let's make sure that we really uh, rigorously evaluate what we're doing before we before we scale up. Um, and the second thing I wanted to say, uh, just before getting a little bit um, specific, is that, um, you know, I think we have a huge amount in, in climate finance uh, to learn from the development humanitarian um, sectors, which are which are a lot older uh, and which have indeed made many, many mistakes, but also learned um, a lot of lessons. And so one of the things we're doing 
on the transitional committee is looking at you know things like the health sector for example how do we how are you know how are we reaching um you know not just looking within climate finance but how are we reaching uh communities well in some of these other sectors in, in terms of how we design new arrangements um so i suppose like 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 others have said earlier you know the kind of loss and damage finance for us is quite a new uh, it's quite a new concept um but if we look at you know some of what we do in other areas um i i think we can see the kind of models that we want to scale up so i would just mention uh and i and i think this is I'm sort of glad that this is sort of echoing what others said earlier, uh, like Ritu and, and Unoni, for example, because I think where one of the areas where I see the most uh, potential is is indeed in in anticipatory action and specifically in shock response and social protection, uh, where you know again there's already been quite a bit of work. There's already been um, you know mistakes made, learn you know lessons learned. We, we've got about forty percent of our humanitarian funding is now going to anticipatory action, um, and uh, and and I think you know some of its country level, some of its global programs like like the draft uh, you know start fund surf and so on and so forth um and, and i think um you know we all know that uh, that anticipatory action works we have the evidence uh, for that and we all know that we never seem to do enough of it um and i think at country level as well our embassies uh, our irish aid programs in different countries are finding um, you know that that there's really um, some some good uh, potential to scale up what they're doing in in those country specific mechanisms, which is coming to also to to some of what Christopher and, and Kishan spoke about uh, in terms of the country ownership. So in Malawi, Uganda, Zambia, um, the PSNP in Ethiopia, which a lot of people would be familiar with, I think we have seen uh, we have seen evidence of of what works, and and I think um, you know these are some of the areas that we'd like to to um to scale up um and just just maybe to come to the last uh the second question again um i, I suppose a, a last few points about maybe what should we bear in mind in terms of that scale up um i mean i think you know one thing that uh that springs to mind i, I would i would totally agree with what's been said about national ownership and, and national systems and, and india is also a very good example of that of course um but i, I suppose a couple of things on that one is uh, we still need to evaluate uh, how how those kind of programs are are working, um, and also we of course need to be very conscious of particularly conflict affected um, uh, you know situations and 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 countries uh, where that kind of national ownership that we've heard about and national systems uh, are just not going to be an option in the same way to reach to reach all the vulnerable populations, and I think. We have evidence, in fact, that climate finance is particularly um, neglected in in uh, fragile and conflict affected states. So we really need to uh, sort that out. And I know there's a process uh, led by uh, the Red Cross and and the World Bank that that many of us are are involved in to try to um, to try to see what we can do about that. Um, another maybe you know scaling up um, you know principle that we should have. I mean, I, Gemma talked about about donors taking more risks, which I totally agree with. Uh, we've heard about flexibility of donor funding, which I totally agree with as well, and, and longer term funding. Um, and, and I think that's something that we're trying to do. We've actually just launched a a big scheme for, for all of our main civil society partners in both development and humanitarian work. One scheme for all of their development and humanitarian work, five years, you know, basically core funding. And I think this is the kind of way that we need to go because these are very difficult contexts um, and we need to be, uh, by definition, very responsive. Um, so I think as donors, you know, we need that that flexible long term funding and also we need to be taking some risks um, ourselves. And um, maybe maybe last point on on risk. Um, you know, I think I think one of the things that we need to be careful of um, in, in, in our work is is not to not to be biased and close off possibilities. Uh, so, for example, you know, one thing that that Ireland is 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 newly funding is the Global Shield program in terms of loss and damage. Um, and there's been quite a bit of bad press about it, frankly, by mostly by a lot of NGOs, kind of saying, you know, oh, this is insurance. It's you know, profit for northern insurance companies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, insurance doesn't work, blah blah blah. And and those are a lot of um, generalizations that just don't hold up and i think we heard um from yononi's presentation earlier that you know we need leveraging you know we need to use uh, whatever we can to get more finance uh into into the climate uh sector um and so i think insurance is 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 one tool and we need many others um and it has its limitations but i think we need to 
get over maybe some uh, of the sort of biases that, oh, well, you know, this is private sector and so on. I think, uh, as others have said, and I think as, as Catherine said as well, we need a variety uh, of actors um, and we need to find ways to work together in the most productive way. And those of us who are maybe more oriented to, you know, communities and all of that, um, we can, of course, try to influence those other uh, those other actors. And um, so so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sinead, and with all of our three speakers, um, thank you so much for being comprehensive, being concise. Um, in particular, Sinead, your points around, you know, not a tough message at all, a very welcome message around that need for better evidence, learning, evaluation. This is so critical for all of us in this patch, I think, to be able to evidence those things so that we can attract better and more financing to the table on this. Um, more use of multi-year and flexible fin financing. That was very critical and important to hear that governments are thinking about that and how they can utilise those in this space as well. Um, and then your points at the end around insurance and really in capturing a broader point around the validity of different types of financing tools in this space so that we're not only looking at donors as governments, we're looking at all sorts of private sector tools as well. It's incumbent on all of us to be able to bring that evidence, evaluation and learning to that diverse group of finances as well. So thank you for those excellent points. I'm really aware we are out of time. Um, thank you so much to our three speakers. I'm really sorry to our in-person audience and the online that we don't have question time for this panel because I think that would have been fantastic, but maybe in a broader three-week session, we could do that to unpack all these issues. So just thanks very much for bearing with us in this sub-panel and over to Ritu or Tom, I think now. Yeah. Thanks all. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. So I'm going to speak very briefly and then pass to Salim for some final words, I suppose, of inspiration as we go. Um, I think what today demonstrates that in an hour and a half, it is tough to get all of the voices in and to have a proper dialogue, but equally, I think an acknowledgement that we need that range of actors to come together. And just as a kind of a recap, we've heard from humanitarian organizations, those working together um, with slum dwellers, those working across a whole system to get resources to the local level through national social protection schemes. We've heard from philanthropists, from development banks, from two governments, um, from donor organizations and so on, all within an hour and a half, all spread around the world and all doing so grappling with the fact that it is imperfect to try and get everybody into a conversation. But I think it equally is exactly, as I said, the illustration of what we need. We do need to acknowledge that all of those groups who have to come together and with others too, with insurers, with investors, um, and to make sure that we can tackle this in a joined up way, but equally not to let there be a situation where the politics of this discussion gets in the way of action. And I think it's a reinforcement that there are routes to action. Yes, we need to make sure that they're working and the money flows in the right ways and so on, but we'll put communities at the heart of that. That's very clear. But also we need now a systemic approach to this. And the effort that we've got with All Act is about a systemic approach of bringing that community together in order to be able to act at scale. So yes, it's early days for this, but we really look forward to welcoming everybody who's been on the panels online in the audience to be part of the journey now, which is about banding together in a much more systemic approach rather than one that fragments, which we've heard is not the way forward. So thank you, everybody. Sincere thanks for the help around this. Final words to Salim um, to send us off into the London afternoon. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you to all the panelists and apologies to the audience who didn't get a chance to uh, say anything at all. Um, so I've spent the last week here in London uh, participating in various events uh, in the London uh, Climate Action Week, and it's been a very, very enlightening uh, exercise. And I feel that this particular event in London has a lot more potential than we, we are making of it. These events that have that have taken place over the last week are all very good, but also fragmented. So can we start bringing, thinking of doing this together in a much more scaled up manner next year? And in the, in the homework for all of us being, connecting with each other, finding collaborative activities and things that we might be able to learn from each other, even do together. And then next year, come back and talk about things that we are doing from the ground level, taking to scale at national level. We heard the case of India 
and then taking to scale at global level because we have no time to lose. I think we are going to have to find a new way of doing things, smarter, quicker, more effective, while we are learning at the same time. So uh, I, I think the London Action, the Climate Action Week is a very good opportunity for us to utilize as a practitioner led um, uh, combination of, of actors, some based in London, some coming into London and some coming in online, but we can actually make that a, a practitioners and action oriented um, a series of events, particularly in, in tackling loss and damage from climate change, which is now my number one agenda. That's all I talk about nowadays, <laughs> avoiding and, and uh, tackling loss and damage. So thank you all very much. I appreciate you all being here and, and uh, thank you to Tom and colleagues at IID for organizing this. Thank you.